Okay, we should be live now, hopefully. Hopefully everybody can uh, hear me okay. Apologies for the wait there. Ran into a little bit of technical difficulty here. So hopefully the chat can let me know if everything is going smoothly. But I think it is. So, yeah, there we go. Everything's good to go. We have a pretty good show today. I have some really good topics, I think, and I think it's gonna. There's gonna be some really interesting conversation uh, to be had, for sure. So, yeah, let's uh, let's do this. Um, I'm sure you can see the background gameplay is going to be the Division Two. I actually bought the new expansion, which is pretty good. It's nothing mind blowing, but it is more division and they made some pretty good changes and I, I've been enjoying it. So I played this mainly uh, for the most of the week, but I also tried the Final Fantasy seven demo, which was really cool. Actually, um, I made a video on that. Uh, it seems like not many people were too interested in my thoughts on Final Fantasy VII Remake, which was, at least the demo, which was kind of disappointing, but I guess also kind of understandable. I haven't really talked about it too much on the channel, and so welcome to everybody just joining the stream. We have almost uh, 200 people uh, currently watching, so if you could do me a favor, first and foremost, be sure to hit the like button. It really helps the stream out, and it's an easy way for you to just support the channel directly. And before I get into the main topics here today, I want to take a moment here to give a, uh, a shout out to all of the channel members. And anybody, as far as I know, can become a channel member. It's an easy way for you to support me directly. And that's basically why it's there. You get some pretty cool PlayStation logos next to your name that change color, depending on how long you've been a member. And I just want to give everybody here a shout out to let you guys know I really appreciate the support you show directly. So we have Devil Child 63, Junior Jackson, Jen, Tom One XD, Vera Dusk, Texas Juggalo One, Ron Pugsley, Crimson X25, Enrico Kitching, Mr. Hamster, Dieter Roos, David Gaines, uh, Claines McKean, hopefully I'm saying that right, and D Darko. I uh, appreciate all of the support you guys show and going above and beyond to support me directly in that way. And so, yeah, as I said, we have some really good topics to go over. The main topic of discussion, or at least in my opinion, the most uh, controversial, I guess you could say, that's going to create a lot of back and forth, is talking about, uh, obviously, the PlayStation 5 and how AMD has essentially confirmed that it will in fact be in RDNA 2, which is a very big deal for uh, the PS5 as well as the Xbox Series X. But we're going to be talking about that new Ghost of Tsushima trailer and how it seems that it essentially shut down the Teraflop talk, at least temporarily. And we have Matt Thornton here. Uh, you say April, Final Fantasy VII Remake, May, The Last of Us Part Two. June Ghost of Tsushima, the year of PlayStation. Yeah, I have to say it is a very exciting year if you are a PlayStation fan. You have some amazing games. Pro probably, and I'm not trying to be hyperbolic when I say this, probably some of the best games in history that you're ever going to play are coming out this year exclusively on the PlayStation 4, which is absolutely fantastic. And I have to say, I am very glad that I own a PlayStation 4 Pro and, uh, yeah, that's the thing uh, about the Ghost of Tsushima release date when we finally got it. June 26th, basically just a month after The Last of Us Part Two. I do have a little bit of a concern with that, and I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit later on. But the first thing we're going to be focusing on here has to do with the Ghost of Tsushima trailer dropping. And not only was it an awesome trailer and obviously gets us extremely excited for the game in general... But I think it kind of proves a lot, right? The number one thing I think it proves is that Sony doesn't really have to do much to make waves. Granted, I'm not trying to say that them dropping a Ghost of Tsushima trailer and release date and some information about, you know, the pre-order bonuses and the different editions of the game. I'm not trying to say that that is on the same level 
as them re revealing some PlayStation 5 news or anything like that, or announcing a new IP or a sequel that'll be on the PlayStation 5. But considering it just kind of came out of nowhere, nobody expected it, it just, in my opinion, it just goes to show that Sony doesn't have to do too much to make waves. And I feel like this has already kind of been proven throughout 2019. We're continuing to see that in 2020. And it really just makes you think, what is it going to be like when they really start dropping the big news? And it just gets you all the more excited. That's not to downplay anything that Microsoft has been doing, because I'm not trying to make it seem that way. But there is no doubt that Anybody who has had negative feelings towards PlayStation, don't worry. Uh, I think they know what they're doing. And the number one thing that this Ghost of Tsushima release date trailer tells me is that the main focus is definitely going to be on ending the PlayStation 4's life cycle in the best possible way they can and ensuring that the 108 million install base is going to be getting a really solid ending to this console generation before they really go into complete full swing with the PlayStation 5. We have the expert genius here. Appreciate the super chat. You say no Xbox Series X games for one to two years. Shaking my head. Yeah, I've talked about that. I mean, I can understand why Microsoft is taking that approach, but there's no doubt that, at least from my perspective, when it comes to the Xbox Series X, I hope that Sony, and I firmly believe Sony will not take the same approach. I'm not saying that every single game that comes from Microsoft Studios needs to be a true exclusive to just the Xbox Series X. However, I think it would be a great thing if we could get at least one or two, or at least the promise of a few or a handful of true Xbox Series X exclusive games that can take full advantage of that console. I know that scalability is better than it ever has been, and... You know, the truth is maybe it will take some developers longer than others to be able to fully utilize all of the power that will be in these next-gen consoles. But if there's any set of developers that could do that from the start or at least get as close to achieving the full potential of what they could do with that kind of power, it has to be the first-party studios from the cons console manufacturer. And you know what I mean? They're the ones that have their hands on it the longest and know it inside and out. But, yeah... Um, it's unfortunate, but we'll see what happens. Maybe it won't be as bad. And the truth is, and I hate to have to admit this, we don't know what Sony's plan really is. I mean, they've kind of heavily hinted at the idea that there will be true PS5 exclusives. We've even heard some people on the inside, like Jason Schreier, claiming that last he heard is there will be some dedicated PS5-only exclusives, which is an extremely exciting prospect if you were to ask me. But getting back to the Ghost of Tsushima trailer, I'm sure as most of you know, the talk for quite some time has been about the power factor and the specifications of the PlayStation 5. It's all been about the T-flop talk, and the truth of the matter is, guys, I entertain that conversation for a couple of reasons. I mean, a part of me does care to a certain extent, but when I think about Next Generation, I'm sorry, but my thoughts don't immediately go to how many teraflops is this console going to be? It does go to how powerful and, uh, you know, how proficient is this console going to be? Like, performance-wise, how big of a leap forward is it going to be? But the truth of the matter is, I'm not sitting here thinking, oh, man, I don't know what I'm going to do if this console isn't 12 or 11 T-flops. I'm going to lose my mind, even though it may come off that way sometimes because we do get into some deep conversations about it. The truth is, it just... It makes for entertaining conversation, and that's why we entertain it so much here on the channel, but the truth is, for me personally, teraflops are not going to really matter all that much at the end of the day, and I think that Sony continues to prove that, at least from their first party, which I know that there's a lot of people are going to be like, well, what about third party MBG? It's easy to sit here and say that, yeah, Sony's first party can take full advantage of the next generation hardware and, and even the current generation hardware and do things on it that third party developers won't do and really just push the bar forward in terms of graphical fidelity and the way games look. But what about the third party games? And the truth is, guys, like, like I've tried to explain 
in previous videos and I'm gonna have to continue to explain it going forward because not everybody understands it and it's understandable that not everybody understands it it's not something that everybody really looks into completely but the truth of the matter is when it comes to the next generation consoles even if Microsoft is out here touting 12 teraflops even if Sony ends up being less than that whether it's 11 10 or 9 teraflops it's not going to matter and that's what people need to understand and anybody who knows exactly what to expect or you know has a very good understanding of what to expect when it comes to next generation knows this even digital foundry themselves that you know you're talking about individuals who were absolute experts in this area have told you that the T flop the war of T flop you know numbers is kind of over and that's because these consoles are going to be so close to one another and the T flop is not a really accurate representation practically speaking realistically speaking it's not an accurate representation of what developers will be able to do with these next generation consoles and that's just the truth of the matter I'm not trying to downplay power I'm not trying to make it sound like this is some type of damage control it's not I know that inevitably some people are going to take it that way but Ghost of Tsushima just proves that the T-flop count doesn't matter okay if you look at that trailer and you watch it in 4k and you see how beautiful that game looks how amazing that game looks coming off of other amazing looking games like God of War, Spider-Man, Days Gone, Death Stranding, right? Not to mention even earlier games like Uncharted 4, right? It's it just Sony continues to prove that it's up to the developers and up to the talent. Now I'm not saying that every game third party is going to look identical on the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5. And that really does come down to what will the true differences between these consoles be specification-wise and power-wise. And over time, you might occasionally see a big difference. We don't know how powerful the PlayStation 5 is. We only know how powerful the Xbox Series X is. And so there are certainly questions that have yet to be answered. And there certainly are many conversations that have yet to be uh, to, you know, had yet. But... I think it's safe to say that Sony knows what they're doing and power has never really been the be all end all when it comes to what you can expect from a console generation, right? And I put out this tweet the other day and I really stand by this and I'm going to read it word for word. I tweeted out, I promise you when it comes to the PlayStation 5, T flops won't mean shit. Once gamers see what Sony has, once they see how good games look and uh, how they're gonna how games are gonna look on the PS5, the features the console will offer, only toxic fanboys will be left thinking about T flops. This holds true even if the PS5 ends up being 14 damn T flops. And I'm saying that because I want you guys to understand that even if the PS5 ends up being some kind of monstrous T-flop number and somehow ends up being more powerful and capable than the Xbox Series X, it's not going to matter that much. It's really not. It's going to be fun to brag about it, of course. And that's why with these conversations you see so many people you know, uh, talking about it because each side wants to have that bragging right i mean there's no doubt that oh we have the most powerful console you know it's just a fun thing to say if you're an enthusiast of said console or said brand so we have a uh, dieter ruse here you say um hey mbg well appreciate the super chat first of all you say hey mbg do you like racing games have you checked out wipeout omega collection i do like racing games but i'm very particular with them i like racing games that are more arcade like but like for example uh, believe it or not, I had an, a blast with Forza Horizon 4. It was the first time I really kind of dived in deep with a racing game of any kind, and I actually got every achievement for it as well as the DLC because I enjoyed it that much. And the Horizon series, in my opinion, is the perfect blend of, uh, you know, mixing a little bit of simulation, but it's mainly arcadey, and it's meant about, like, the fun factor. And so that's what I look for in racing games. They're not my favorite 
genre of game, but I do like to entertain, uh, you know, the idea of trying to be more diverse in what I look for in my games. And so racing games for sure are something that I look into. I have not tried the Wipeout Omega Collection yet. Maybe in the future at some point that's something I'll try out. I can't make any promises, but yeah, I, I do like racing games from time to time. I will be interested to see what uh, Microsoft and Sony's next-gen offerings are when it comes to the first-party racing games. So, again, thank you for the super chat. We have Randy Lee here. Appreciate your super chat, buddy. You say, I think both consoles will exceed 10.7 teraflops because of Google Stadia's selling point. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I mean, at this point, it's like I've seen people, and this is kind of where we're going to combine two topics into one, where we're going to talk about, we're going to continue to talk a little bit about Ghost of Tsushima because I do have more to say about that. But I also want to mention the PlayStation 5 RDNA 2 uh, coming out of AMD. I've seen some people say to me that MBG seems to not understand that a console such as the PS5 can still be 9.2 T-flops in RDNA 2 architecture. And yes, I'm aware that that is true. And so when I say that the GitHub leak of 9.2 T-flops got debunked, I'm not saying that like it, it was legitimate, right? Like that was a real thing. We just don't have the full picture and there's a lot of context missing. And the fact that this console is going to be RDNA 2 just kind of throws an even bigger wrench into that 9.2 T-flop number because at that time, that leak was claiming that the PlayStation 5 would be an RDNA 1 or a Navi 10. Now we know based off of what AMD has said that that's not true. And I do, I do think you're right. I highly doubt that Sony would be okay with the idea of Google Stadia having that leg up on them. Like, it's one thing if Microsoft's sitting at 12 T-flops, okay, fine. Like, Microsoft made it clear that they want to retain that power factor. But, you know, <laughs> let me just put it to you this way. Regardless of whether or not we see uh, <laughs> Sony not be able to hit that 10.7 T-flop number, it's not going to matter when it comes to Google Stadia, okay? Like, I'm not trying to be uh, rude when it comes to people who maybe like Google Stadia, but Google is not off to a good start. Um, I don't know what they're going to be able to do to kind of turn Google Stadia around. And so even if the PS5 were to not hit that 10.7 T-flop number, at least in regards to Google Stadia, it's not going to matter. Like, PlayStation crushes Google Stadia any day of the week. That's just a fact of the matter. I mean, Google Stadia isn't even part of the conversation, if I'm being completely honest. But I wouldn't be surprised if Sony did look at that metric and say, okay, at the very least, we got to be above 10.7. We've heard a lot of people say that 9.2 T-flops is, in fact, not the T-flop count of the PlayStation 5. But again, it's not going to matter. Like, the games we're going to see on the PlayStation 5 are going to melt people's faces, okay? Like, I, I promise you guys, like, the second people see... Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn 2 or a sequel to Horizon Zero Dawn or the next God of War or the next Spider-Man or even Days Gone 2, whatever, right? Even upgraded versions of current games like The Last of Us Part 2 and Ghost of Tsushima, once people see that, they are not going to be thinking or talking about T-flops. And once they see third-party games and how amazing they are going to look, even if Microsoft does have some kind of slight advantage with, you know, slightly better ray tracing or something, I promise you, it's still not going to matter that much at the end of the day. Uh, we have Mr. Hamster. Uh, once again, appreciate you showing up to the stream, buddy, and uh, showing your support. You say, none go to GameStop ask and ask which console has more T-flops. And yeah, you do bring up a very good point. Not many people who are buying a video game console, the first thing that, com that they're thinking, most people, I mean, I'm sure there are some, is... Well, how many T-flops is it? And it's common for people to ask which one is more powerful, but the conversation gets messy because if you were to walk into a GameStop and you were to talk to an employee and you were to ask them, you know, which console is more powerful? And they're going to say, well, currently the Xbox One X is the most powerful console. But, the, you know, at that point, this person, I would hope is going to also mention, but if you're looking for maybe some of the best looking games that have been made this generation, you might want to consider the PlayStation 4 Pro because yes, if you're looking to play Red Dead Redemption 2, there's no doubt that the best looking version of that, um, you know, aside from PC is going to be on the Xbox One X. 
But if you look at, you know, this massive slew of exclusive games that the PlayStation 4 has and, you know, the ones that are enhanced on the PlayStation 4 Pro, you're probably going to find that some of the best looking games are on there, you know, and even then most third party games look nearly identical between the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X, you know, uh, earlier in the generation with the PS4 and the base model Xbox One. Unfortunately, the conversation wasn't the same. The truth is there were games, more games, that really you could see the difference. Like Battlefield 4 was one. Um, there's a bit, you can see a big visual difference between playing in native 720p versus playing in native 1080p. Granted, the difference between 900p and 1080p isn't nearly as significant. And as the generation went on, the gap lessened further and further between the consoles. But that just kind of backs up my point where we're entering the law of diminishing returns. It's going to start coming into play here. And because of that, realistically speaking, most people are not going to see a difference. And Ghost of Tsushima, listen, we have been we have been begging Sony for more PlayStation 5 news and info. And while we didn't get anything officially on the PS5, except for maybe what AMD had to say about it, we have Sony dropping some news here talking about Ghost of Tsushima, the release date, and talking about The Last of Us TV series. And you see just how much hype that generates alone, and they just prove that they can continue the conversation without the need to rely so heavily on just next-gen talk. They are able to save that for a more important time as we get closer to it. So we have Sean Davis here and Spider-Man. I want to acknowledge you both because you seem to have... Uh, both on a super chat at the same time, so thank you guys. And Sean Davis says here, The Last of Us 2 story trailer soon, and meta Metacritic predictions for The Last of Us 2 and Ghost of Tsushima. And yeah, see, that alone, like once we start getting in the full swing with the marketing of The Last of Us Part 2 and Ghost of Tsushima, I really don't know how much room will be left for Sony to talk about the PS5 without those two things conflicting. I mean, the fact that The Last of Us 2 and Ghost of Tsushima are already so close to one another, on top of... Uh, Final Fantasy 7 Remake, it's a little, like, I'm glad I'm not the one who has to plan out the marketing strategy for all of this stuff over at Sony, because they have their hands full. I mean, there is such a thing as, like, stepping on on your own toes here, you know what I mean? And uh, kind of getting in your own way, and that's my only concern, and that's a good concern to have, because we're just getting that much stuff, you know? It's a really good time to be a PlayStation fan, but that is a concern nonetheless, and I have to imagine Sony has everything meticulously planned, and it'll be interesting. I just hope that they don't get in their own way here. So very interesting thing. And yeah, you talk about Metacritic predictions. Lots of conversations we have there about how these games are going to be critically received. And then we have Spider-Man saying, what if uh, what if Adam was saying about the consoles having... Ar oh, sorry, you're saying... Uh, uh, you're saying AMD. I, I got really confused there for a second. You're saying, what if... AMD was uh, saying about the consoles having RDNA 2 was referring to the Xbox Series X and Lockhart. AMD didn't mention Sony specifically. Nothing is set until Sony reveals. Well, listen, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, Spider-Man. I'm going to have to shut that down because when they did their presentation, they did have both the PlayStation 5 logo and the Xbox Series X logo. So, you know, the there's no way, and you have to trust me on this, there's no way AMD would be talking about a console that has yet to even be announced or revealed to any capacity. Um, they wouldn't do that. And they wouldn't do that and then also show the PlayStation 5 logo. So you have to believe me when I tell you when they're talking about next-gen consoles, they are talking about both the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X. They are absolutely not talking about Xbox Lockhart. Whether or not Xbox Lockhart is in fact a real thing and it does end up launching alongside the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X, I promise you that's not what AMD was talking about. Um, I mean, you're free to believe what you want, but you have to look at things rationally and realistically here, and that's not what they were referring to. You also have to understand that uh, PlayStation being the market leader... Um, it's in AMD's best interest to make sure that they are talking about PlayStation to some capacity. They would not leave PlayStation out of the conversation during their, uh, you know, investors' presentation. Believe me, they wouldn't. So hopefully that answers that. Um, we have Samson Ironman. Uh, appreciate the super chat, buddy. 
You said, I would love a PlayStation 5 with 9.2 teflops at $400. Well, see, that's where things get a little bit murky here. Because, as I've talked about before, and, and this is going to be so critical, man. Like, when it comes to next generation, pricing is going to be so critical. Because even though I say that Sony shuts down the teflop talk, it's only temporarily. The T-Flop talk is not going to stop because the second Sony opens their mouth about the PS5 again, because Microsoft came out in front and they said, we're 12 T-Flops, because of that, people are going to immediately harass Sony and be like, how, how many T-Flops is it? How many T-Flops is it? And it's going to be up to Sony to, if they do in fact have a 9.2 T-Flop console, to control that narrative. And I will tell you this. I will tell you this, I don't care how expensive the PlayStation 5 is to manufacture component-wise, Sony cannot, I repeat, cannot release a $500 console that has 9.2 T-flops going up against a $500 12 T-flop Xbox Series X. Because the truth is, even though I say T-flops won't matter, in that case, it will matter. And that will be tough for Sony, especially if microsoft does have a cheaper lower end console as well that would i don't want to say that would spell doom because the truth is i think sony realistically speaking would still be just fine like being completely honest they would be fine however they would lose a lot of ground uh that would be tough for them man because at that point even though i mean you could say just let the games do the talking and let the price take a back seat but still we have to be realistic here. Even Sony knows that if they do have a 9.2 T-flop console, they cannot sell it at the same price for you know going up against a 12 T-flop Xbox. I mean, they would be okay, but they would be losing so much ground by doing that that it's risk versus reward. And it would come off a little bit arrogant as well, where like even though most of us could probably look at each other and say, it's still worth the $500, right? Like it is. There's a lot of people who are going to look at that and be like, well, if I'm going to pay that same price, why not get the more powerful console? You know, 12 versus nine. Again, again, I have to emphasize that is if, that's a big if the PlayStation 5 is in fact 9.2 T-flops. But it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. We have Eric here. Uh, appreciate the super chat, buddy. You're saying Xbox Series X Six hundred dollars, uh, PS Five five hundred dollars, Xbox Lockhart four hundred. Bet uh, that's a bet you're making. You're saying we hear it here first. Um, I will say this: while it seems highly unlikely as of right now that Microsoft would put out a six hundred dollar console, I will say that if they do in fact have a Lockhart console, that they're going to be selling at three hundred they would be much more inclined or comfortable in my opinion. And I know I've said this last week, but it's worth repeating here again. They would be much more comfortable, I imagine, saying, okay, we're going to sell this thing at $600 because you know that the Xbox Series X is not a cheap console to manufacture. I mean, that's cutting edge. So uh, it's really pushing the limit. And so, you know, that's again... That's where price is going to be so critical here. It's not just going to be about the T-flop talk. It's also about the price talk. Because a 9.2 T-flop PS5 at $400 suddenly seems much more appealing than if it were $500 to most people, right? Uh, so we also have Spider-Man once again. You say Sony would rather be cheaper than more powerful. You may, Yeah, I mean, the truth is you're probably right about that because the truth is... Sony understands that they have a huge install base and they saw that sometimes power isn't really the only thing that matters and and Sony's kind of proven that power isn't the only thing that matters like if they can make their console more efficient right like it's about performance and efficiency and the number one thing we've been hearing about the PlayStation 5 is and again this just kind of backs up what I've been saying about why T-flop talk doesn't really matter all that much at the end of the day it's about efficiency. It's about what you're going to see because efficiency and performance, performance specifically, doesn't always immediately line up with the T-flop number. The T-flop number, for those who don't know what a teraflop is, it is just a general overall measurement of total compute power. 
it is not the truest, most accurate representation of what developers can do on a console and what is possible on a console. That is why the T-flop number doesn't matter ultimately. It's not the be-all, end-all. There's a lot of other factors you have to take into account, talent always being one of them. So um, if you guys could do me a favor, we've, we're about 30 minutes into the podcast here. If you could do me a favor, we have almost 500 people watching, which I appreciate it. Appreciate everybody who showed up. Be sure to hit the like button. If you could do that for me right now, it really helps the podcast out. And it's an extremely easy way for you to show your support here on the channel. So be sure to hit that like button. Um, and so to kind of finish off this conversation that we're having here about Ghost of Tsushima shutting down the T-Flop talk. Again, you look at that trailer, you look at how amazing that game looks graphically, and I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. It just goes to show what talent can do. Third-party developers can do what Sucker Punch is doing with Ghost of Tsushima graphics-wise on the PS4 Pro. It's just a matter of talent and them, you know, wanting to put the extra effort in there. And, uh, you know, this is where the one thing we've heard and this is official, this is something we've officially heard from Sony and other developers as well, is that the PS5, according to them, is the easiest time they've ever had uh, working on a console like and, and making games for it. And that is great news, honestly. So, yeah, we have um, Junior Jackson here. You say, MBG, will you play The Last of Us Part 2 on PS4, PS5, or both? Will this mindset... mindset hurt the beginning sales of the game. Well, for me, I will certainly be playing it on both. And I honestly don't think it's going... I mean, it depends. It depends on what, how Sony plans to talk about the PlayStation 5 because if they're basically just like all upgrades are free and you're not going to have to pay for anything and we're not going to resell it, then I don't think it will hurt it. I think the only time it could hurt it is if Sony makes it extremely unclear what they plan to do with the uh you know like the upgrade system and and how they're going to handle that so i'm going to play it on both uh and i appreciate your super chat buddy um and i appreciate you being a member of the channel here and we actually do have a new member to welcome randy lee i really appreciate you choosing to support me directly and uh, joining the channel and becoming a member um maybe in the future because youtube implemented this thing where now you can do member-only streams. Uh, in the future, uh, you know, I hope to maybe add some more incentive for people to want to choose to support me on the channel here directly. I know as of right now, the only thing I'm offering is um, is the the logo next to your name. So again, I really want to say thank you and how, let you know how appreciative I am of those of you who are choosing to go above and beyond and support the channel directly. It certainly does not go unnoticed here. So. Uh, appreciate all the support guys and uh, the final thing I need to say here before moving on to the next topic because we do have a lot of topics to go over and talk about uh, in this podcast in regards to Ghost of Tsushima the release date June 26th not only is this extremely um, soon right like that's a great thing but I am a little bit concerned at how Sony is going to manage all of this because I I could, I mean, I'm just going to be real here. The Last of Us Part 2 is a bigger game than Ghost of Tsushima. That's not taking anything away from Ghost of Tsushima. That's just the fact of the matter. Everybody knows this. And so my worry is that, is there enough room, breathing room for Ghost of Tsushima? Because you think about The Last of Us Part 2 dropping on May 29th, it'll have about four weeks like before Ghost of Tsushima comes out. My question is, do like what is the conversation surrounding the last of us part two going to be like when it comes to just you know people still playing it people still talking about it, all this stuff how is that going to affect the launch of ghost of tsushima maybe i'm being a little bit overly cautious and worried here but that is something i can't help but think because i'm not going to lie to you guys i really thought ghost of tsushima would have been like an august but more realistically a september game this tells me that sony's trying to make sure the way is clear all summer long they're going to be hardcore marketing the playstation 5 that's in my opinion what this tells me them releasing ghost of tsushima so close to the last of us part two and just kind of crunching everything together in a way where it's like like a massive explosion of just 
games, right? Exclusive games on the PlayStation 4 to the point where it's people are going to be, you know, they're going to have to delegate their time and money and what they want to play. So we have uh, Samson Ironman once again. Appreciate the uh, super chat, buddy. You say, the world is going into a recession because of the virus. Price will be a, will be huge in people's decision, especially parents, when deciding what console to buy. And yeah, I mean, you're not wrong about that. I mean, the virus just kind of adds fuel to the fire, right? It just adds on top of everything else. But the truth is, price has always been such a critical component of a console's success. Think back to the PlayStation 1, guys, for those who don't know. For those who don't know... I forget what what conference it was at. I don't know if it was at like GDC or if it was at like E3. I think it was at E3 potentially. But Sony came out and just announced 299. You know, 299. And that's all that's literally all they said because their competition was selling at 399 at that time. I forget which console it was. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'm sure you guys know. Somebody in the chat can tell me. But that just goes to show how price conscious Sony always has been until they got kind of arrogant in uh you know in, in in 2006 with the PS3 and they learned a valuable lesson where okay doesn't matter how dominant we are we need to not get too ahead of ourselves and i think that that was an important lesson to be learned for sony back in the PS3 era they're going to carry that lesson over now going from the PlayStation 4 to the PlayStation 5 and that makes me feel really good because there are some people who are afraid that sony's going to get really arrogant all of a sudden but price the yeah, the Sega Saturn there you go uh, thank you and, you know, price has always played such a critical role. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to take a little drink of water here, getting a little, throat's getting a little bit hoarse. Okay, all right. So, yeah, I might make a, a, a dedicated video talking about Ghost of Tsushima's release date and kind of just uh, not only talking in a positive way, about you know how awesome Sony is being ending the generation this way with freaking amazing games man like it's a kind of unbelievable honestly it's a little bit overwhelming and that's not even talking about the third party games we're going to be getting but I also want to talk about the potential concern about how Sony's going to juggle this marketing uh, you know, just just this marketing challenge they have here, and it's going to be critical that they execute on that. The good thing is Sony's been very good at marketing, so I'm not that worried, but it's still something we need to consider. Now, the next topic was going to be on uh, AMD, you know, talking about RDNA 2, and so I want, we have kind of already been talking about that, but one thing we need to talk about that is incredibly important that I need people to understand, because too many people don't understand this. When it comes to the architecture of these next generation consoles, the true and this is just like you want to whittle it down to like the absolute truth. The absolute truth of the matter is it doesn't matter that much. Now, I know that sounds contradictory to what I've been saying, but you have to understand it this way. When it comes to the APU of these consoles, the APU is just the overall you know, design, you know, how everything's going to work together, the GPU, the CPU, and just, you know, what makes up the entirety of the console and how it's going to work in sync together. You know, you talk about console balance. When it comes to the design of the APU, things become so heavily customized that at some point, it's like the naming convention that AMD has to describe, you know, to, to, to differentiate between this is GCN, this is RDNA 1, this is RDNA 2. What you basically see happen with consoles is things become so highly customized that you're, you know, the naming convention doesn't really matter much because, for example, the reason why some people maybe are confused or heavily believing that the PS5 is going to be an RDNA 1, but then they ask, well, how can it be an RDNA 1 if it also has all of the same features of RDNA 2, which is leading people like me and many others to just say, look, it's RDNA 2 because it has all of the features that RDNA 2 would have. It's because Mark Cerny and Sony themselves are heavily customizing this where they're basically like, we're going to we're going to take the off the shelf architecture and we're going to kind of put our own spin on it and, and make some tweaks and adjustments to it. So that way it kind of fits what we're trying to strive for with this console. Again, keyword balance. They're looking for a balance. People are talking about how price conscious Sony is and how important it is. 
Yes, it is. And so they also understand that these consoles need to be very powerful and they need to have extremely high performance. So it's up to them to kind of just make their own tweaks to it and, you know, customizations to be able to make it to where, again, this just further emphasizes why T-flop count literally doesn't matter. Because you're going to have Mark Cerny go in there and do some customization to the APU that literally nobody was probably expecting in terms of, you know, exactly how it's going to be done, you know, the Cerny method and all this stuff. And you're going to realize that, oh, okay, so it turns out 9.2 T-flops or 10 T-flops or 13 T-flops, whatever it may be, just doesn't matter because this thing's a freaking monster. This thing's going to do amazing things for games because of the customization that Sony put into it, the, the customization of the APU. And I, I'm just stressing that here because there's a lot of people, you know, it's so easy to get focused and I and hung up on, and I, I'm guilty of it myself here on the channel, on RDNA 1, RDNA 2, 9 T-flops, 12 T-flops, 14 T-flops. Like, guys, Sony knows what they're doing. Just wait till you see what they have on offer. Wait till you see it for yourself it's not going to matter. And uh, yeah, I just had to say that. But we're going to move right along here. Again, hit the like button if you haven't already done that uh, to, to show your support here. I'll probably just continue to say that after every topic just to remind people. But we're moving right along here. And this also has to do with AMD kind of revealing the Xbox One sales. Uh, I see you, Mr. Hamster. You're saying, LOL, the chat room went from T-flop discussion to virus discussion. Yeah, it's kind of hard not to have this discussion, uh, you know, when it comes to the virus that's spreading around right now. And we're going to talk actually about that a little bit later in this podcast because we're going to be talking about E3 and how it's looking more and more likely E3 could be canceled or at the very least kind of just... Um, kind of whittled down to uh, a shell of what it, you know, is supposed to be. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But AMD kind of indirectly revealed the sales numbers of the Xbox One. And I think you guys might be a little bit surprised at the stance I actually have on this or my opinion on this because I've seen a lot of people mentioning this. Basically, AMD revealed that there is a total of 150 million consoles sold between the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. And the reason why they're revealing this is because they are the supplier of the components in each of these consoles. And we know that Sony has revealed the sales figures of the PlayStation 4, and it's sitting at about 108 million, probably a little bit more now at 109, maybe even 110, because it's been a little while since we got that update, I, I believe in January. And, you know, that base, if you just do some basic math, that is basically leaving the Xbox One anywhere in the ballpark, but, you know, give or take, there's definitely some room for error here. Uh, between 40 and 45 million, I highly doubt it's beyond 45 million consoles sold. It could be. But it's certainly not beyond 50 million. And so while there's some people who think I'm going to be like, ah, ha, ha, take that, Xbox, that actually makes me kind of sad, uh, truthfully. And, you know, I say that because I would love to see a situation where it's like a total of, you know, um, 300 million consoles between the two are sold, 150 million PS4s and 150 million Xbox Ones. I say that because... I'm a passionate gamer when it comes to console gaming, and it's my favorite way of playing video games. I say this, I've said this so many times on my channel. Uh, I grew up playing games on console, and that's why I'm not a big fan of PC gaming, and there's just something about that experience that's so inherent to gaming to me. And all I really want is to see that market continue to grow and not just not just survive, right? Like I don't want to see the console market just survive. I want to see it thrive. And the only way it can do that is if consoles become more and more relevant. And the easiest way to determine how relevant console gaming is, is looking at sales numbers. This is why I heavily support Sony because they're the market leader. And there's a reason for that. It's because they've decided a long time ago that console hardware sales are critical to them. Absolutely critical, just like it will be with the PS5. And so I want to continue to see that. And so, you know, it's there are certainly many reasons why the Xbox One probably could not pass that 50 million sold threshold. Even Xbox fanboys understand this, right? But what my great hope is, is that next generation, it's a different story. Um, I'm actually probably going to do a separate video talking about how an analyst, uh, you know, predicted where I think this is a, a good prediction. And it's one I agree with that 
both of these consoles are going to uh, end up surpassing the sales numbers of what we see this generation with the PS4 and the Xbox One. So that's what I'm hoping for as well, and I think that we are going to see that. But we have Joseph Levi here. You're saying, uh, Joseph Levi here, <laughs> you're saying Uncharted needs a TV series. I agree with that. We're actually, um, we're going to get back to that, Joseph, because we're going to be talking about the Last of Us TV series or the HBO series, and we're going to talk a little bit about an update we've gotten on the Uncharted movie as well. I certainly have some opinions on that, as I'm sure you guys do as well. But yeah, we're not going to spend too much time on this topic because... I mean, there's not much to be said except the fact that AMD basically revealed the sales numbers of the Xbox One, and it I don't think it's surprising to anybody. It is unfortunate, though, and I just hope that... I, I, I don't know how important console sales are going to be to Microsoft with the upcoming generation. I have to imagine not very important at all, but I'm still rooting for the Xbox as a console, and I want to see it sell much better than it did with the Xbox One because the better the console sells, the more of an inclination that will give Xbox, the, the, it'll signal to Microsoft and Phil Spencer that, oh, okay, people still do care greatly about hardware, so we should care about hardware more so than ever. And granted, Microsoft is showing a lot of good signs of caring about hardware, but you know, I think it's safe to say that the Xbox Series consoles will not suffer the same fate that we saw with the Xbox One in terms of, you know, how it's going to get off, like, what, what type of start it's going to get off to. So, we're going to move along here. Let me just take another drink here. I have to announce when I'm going to take a drink uh, because <laughs> I feel like if I don't, you're just going to hear, like, you know, dead air and people are going to assume that I got, like, my audio cut out or something. So, uh... Let's see here. Um, we're going to talk about E3. All right. And this is interesting because a lot of you guys were bringing up the uh, coronavirus and whatnot. And, you know, I have my thoughts on the coronavirus. Um, all I want to say about the virus in general is I think people tend to blur the line between precaution and panic very easily. And that is absolutely not helped by some, and I emphasize some media, that really tries to get people worked up. I mean, I literally saw a video yesterday of people in Walmart fighting over toilet paper. And I'm just like, I'm baffled at human behavior sometimes because I'm just thinking like, what is happening? First of all, why are people, <laughs> I, know, I know this isn't really gaming related, but I, I gotta go on my little rant here. Why are people buying up all the damn toilet paper? Like, save some for some other people, okay? Like, just, there's no reason to be out here breaking out into, like, a legitimate fight. Like, you're about to fist fight somebody over toilet paper. People need to calm the hell down when it comes to this stuff and realize that, like, it's about precaution. Buy some extra toilet paper if you need it. Don't buy all the toilet paper so no one else can have any. This goes for all, you know, uh, other necessities as well. Like, I don't understand people who are going into full-blown panic mode. Like, yes, the coronavirus is a serious thing because we don't know too much about it yet. And we're still learning a lot. And there are people, unfortunately, dying. Uh, but people die of, you know, there's people dying of things all over. It's just the ra the rate at which this virus is spreading is what's causing the most concern. And I just think people need to calm down a little bit where take precautions. Like you see GDC postponing. Okay, that's precaution. But people making it sound like, oh man, like gaming is over. Gaming's ending. The coronavirus is taking out gaming. Like let's let's reel it in a little bit. Okay, let's not fight over toilet paper. Let's not assume that the gaming industry is going to crash entirely. Let's just look at it for what it is. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Mr. Hamster, you say that you literally fainted in the office this Thursday, man. That's not good, bro. Man, I hope you're. Uh, I hope you're okay, buddy. Um, you know, take take care of yourself. Stay hydrated. Keep your immune system strong, wash your hands, do all that stuff. Again, take precaution, but um, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope that everything's okay with you, buddy. I really do, because uh, it's never good when, when people have that type of stuff happen. So uh, take care of yourself, man. Um, hopefully it's nothing uh, serious. But 
Um, you say you still got a fever. Yeah, stress. Yeah, it's all about the stress, guys. You got it. You got. You have to maintain control your stress. You can't avoid stress. It's how you handle stress that matters. That's what most people don't un don't understand. You are in control of the stress levels that your body feels, and there's going to be stress all around you from everyday life, you know. And this is just MBG here trying to give you some life advice. You got to control your stress levels. We all have those moments where you're just super stressed out, but it's how you handle it. It's just like talking. It's not what you say. It's how you say it because you're going to say a lot of things, but how you say those things ultimately determines the reaction that you get out of people. Just like how you handle stress is going to determine the reaction you get from your body. So hopefully that helps. Take care of yourself, Mr. Hamster. I don't want to say anything happening to you, buddy, uh, but we got a little bit sidetracked in a way because what I was trying to talk about here is that, um, you know, E3 might seriously be in trouble, guys. Like, and the thing is, I think it's like what Los Angeles is where E3 is going to be held. They declared a state of emergency. No, no, I'm not a doctor. I'm just trying to give what I believe is good advice to people who are maybe feeling stressed out. You know, that's all it is. I am absolutely not a doctor. Okay. So, you know, just, it's just advice. Um, not medical advice, just life advice. That's all it is. So don't misinterpret that. Uh, but we have JS here. You say must be fun trying to make videos daily with the limited news. Well, that's the thing is like, I do like to try to create daily content and I won't lie. It does become stressful at times because I'm thinking, well, I don't want the quality of my content to degrade just for the sake of getting something out there. But at the same time, I do like to do daily content. So it's a balance and that's what it all comes down to. It's a balance of trying to, uh, you know, find the best content I can or what I think will be interesting to my audience while not, you know, do, doing it at the sake of, you know, degrading the quality. But yeah, it's, you say it's fun. It can be fun. I mean, I won't lie. Like doing YouTube is, is a fun thing, but it can also be a stressful thing. And that's just, that's with anything in life, anything you do, there's two sides to every coin. Uh, that's just the way it is. But I appreciate that super chat JS, but yeah, Los Angeles declared a state of emergency and everybody's looking at E3. Like, so what are you guys going to do now? And they're like, uh, well, we're looking at this with, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at it intensely. Like we're going to, we're going to watch the situation and it's just kind of like, everybody's looking at them like, guys, it's looking like E3 might get canceled if this thing doesn't slow down. And, uh, I believe it was the comp the company I am eight bit. They recently just announced that they're pulling out of E3, which is a pretty significant thing because I I'm pretty sure this is the company that was kind of responsible for planning most of E3 or kind of like building the show up and kind of like introducing all of these new things that the ESA was hoping would be introduced to kind of, you know, um, make it more relevant, you know? And so I guess my big question is what will happen with E3 if it does get canceled? And my answer that I can think of is I think that'll be the end of it. I like E3, like E3 is exciting, but it just, in my opinion, hasn't been the same in the past couple of years. And now it's on a what I thought was a, a steady decline, which might turn into a rapid decline. And it makes me wonder what Microsoft is going to do. And it really does kind of speak to what Sony decided to do by not participating in E3 for the second year. It seems to me like they made the right call, if I'm being honest. And I, I, it's going to be interesting to see if we see a rapid um, pulling out of all these companies, just like we saw with GDC, where it's like a snowball effect. And we could very well see that. And it might just take one of these companies, one of these bigger companies announcing they're not going to be attending E3 because of this. And then you might see a snowball effect after that. And before you know it, it may be the literal end of E3. Now, that's just me being glass half empty. But, I mean, Los Angeles just declared a state of emergency. And I just don't see if that if that holds up by the time E3 rolls around. I, I don't know what's going to happen at that point. So... Yeah, interesting stuff going on there. But moving on from that, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the huge announcement that The Last of Us is getting an HBO series. Now, this is a, a pretty significant thing, and I have some things to say, but before doing that, JS, once again, um, appreciate the super chat again here, buddy. You say, the store I work 
Uh, the store where you work, we had a guy claim he had the virus. He looked super sick. I'm in Washington State. Hope you all stay safe. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's it's starting to spread in the United States a little bit more now, or even kind of like rapidly. And the thing about this virus is it's not a death sentence for most people, but it does seem like it raises some potential serious complications for um for older people and people with potentially compromised immune systems. And so, yeah, when you say everybody stay safe, again, it's about not panicking, just taking proper precautions. You know, most, you know, younger people, you know, people who aren't older, they have healthy immune systems. And the chances are you could probably pass it just like a normal virus. You have to understand the thing that the media doesn't report on is how many people are literally leaving the hospitals because they recovered from coronavirus, you know? And when you realize that there's been, I think, what, like over 50, I don't know if it's 50, I think it might be 50,000, but it's a really high number of people just walking out because they recovered from the coronavirus. And I'm not saying that that means, oh, you shouldn't worry about it. But again, it's people, you have to take proper precautions for not only the safety of yourself, but the safety of other people. You can't be irresponsible. I mean, you've seen people in China, like videos of people purposely trying to spread it, which is insane to me. It just goes to show like how effed in the head some people are, man. But yeah, everybody stay safe. Um, Just take proper precautions. That's really all you can do. Try to keep your immune system as healthy as you can. You got to cut down on the carbohydrates, guys. Cut down on the sugar. I'm about to make this a, uh, I'm I'm about to make this not a PlayStation podcast, but a nutrition podcast, even though I have terrible diet myself. But uh, yeah, Um, before I go completely off the rails here, Mr. Hamster, you say, use Xbox body wash to keep clean from the virus, bro. You know what? I'm not going to lie to you. If there was ever a time where Microsoft should be marketing their body wash products or their uh, hygiene products, it's right now, Mr. Hamster, telling you it's right now. You know, this would be the time when people would actually maybe not make fun of it completely. But yeah, I agree. If you have the Xbox body wash, make good use of it, you know? But uh, all right, we got, um, so let's see, Velcro Apple, you say, I went keto and lost 50 pounds. Yeah. See, the keto diet, in my opinion, I consider that like an elite diet because it's so hard for people to realistically, and because it's not, I don't like to call it a diet because people who do it, it's like a lifestyle, right? Like you have to literally change your lifestyle to actually maintain a keto diet. I know this is really random, but you know, this is the fun of doing a podcast. I can kind of like veer off a little bit. And I, I consider it like an elite lifestyle change because doing keto and sticking to it is a very hard thing, especially for somebody who is uh, you know, totally used to consuming high amounts of carbohydrates, but yeah. Um, moving on from that, <laughs> whatever we were just talking about, cause I'm really getting lost now and I want to, I want to make sure this thing doesn't go completely off the rails. Um, the last of us is getting an HBO series. All right. So this came out of left field. Uh, Sony announced this and I have to admit, I'm a little confused why Sony would announce this on the same day that they would choose to announce the release date and uh, release a new trailer for Ghost of Tsushima because it seems a little bit conflicting. I know they're they're two different things, but it's coming from the same source. And I, I genuinely have to ask myself, did the news of the Last of Us HBO series potentially overshadow the release date announcement for Ghost of Tsushima? Um, I, I really have to wonder that and I kind of hope that that's not the case because um it it was an extremely exciting thing to witness the announcement of the last of us tv series especially knowing it's going to be hbo but then I was kind of thinking like uh what what are you know like what are it's conflict it's just it just creates unnecessary conflict that's all I'm trying to say like I kind of wish that sony would have like maybe earlier in the week talked about Ghost of Tsushima, give it its own time in the sun briefly before moving on to talk about the Last of Us TV series. But I'm not I'm not marketing. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a professional marketer, so I don't know uh, you know, I don't know what is best. I'm sure maybe Sony had their reason for doing this, but either way it's a huge announcement and thank you, Seth, for uh yeah, keeping keeping the chat uh under control here. Appreciate that. Um but 
The Last of Us getting an HBO series is absolutely massive, and there was like this viral uh, picture that started to go around of an actor and an actress who looked literally just like Joel and Ellie. Granted, I'd never heard of them before, and people were saying like they need to cast these, you know, cast them. And I agree, like it would be awesome if we could get that. But um, there's just so many. I mean, Neil Druckmann is set to write and produce this, which I think gives people the most hope about this thing actually being good. Not to mention that HBO doesn't just greenlight anything. HBO actually likes to ensure that this is going to be a high quality show that they're going to put a lot of money into and they maintain that like high bar of quality. So seeing Naughty Dog, PlayStation, and HBO working together, it's actually phenomenal because you're going to get an extremely high quality show. I guess my only real question with it is, you know, who is... Like, what is the story going to be? Is it going to be Joel and Ellie's story? Uh, and is it we're just going to see it translated over to TV? Or is it going to be a completely new story with new survivors, a new perspective? I'm going to be interested to learn about that. But we also got some information on the, uh, the Uncharted movie. Apparently, the director... I don't have his name off the top of my head here, but the director of Venom as well as the Zombieland movies, is going to be directing Uncharted 4, or the Uncharted movie, which is going to be heavily based off of Uncharted 4, or they're going to draw from that, I assume, from when the, the sections you play where Nathan Drake is younger. Um, and so that's, that's good news in my opinion. Um, it seems like they have a pretty solid director on board. Hopefully he doesn't drop out like every other director. <laughs> but on top of that, Antonio Banderas, uh, he's actually, it's funny because he's like the dude that's featured in all these PS4 memes, ironically enough, has actually been cast for the movie as well. We don't know which role he's going to play. We can assume maybe he's going to play the villain. Uh, but he's a very top-notch actor, and you know I think Mark Wahlberg was recently quoted in saying that what is happening with the Uncharted movie is like a very unique experience or very different from what he uh, you know has done in the past. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out because I have much more faith in the Last of Us HBO series than I do the Uncharted movie. But I think the Uncharted movie has potential as well. And if it does fail, maybe we could see them try to, like, back off and, like, okay, rather than doing, like, a movie and doing a bunch of sequels to it, we'll do a TV series just like we're doing with HBO. And uh, I see people mentioning that they would like to see Hugh Jackman play the role of Joel in the Last of Us TV series, and I have to agree with that. That's my pick because he's a, he's a phenomenal actor. Like, that's the thing is, like, it's not just because he has the look, but Hugh Jackman is an amazing actor, and I think he would just absolutely crush the role of Joel like I could just see him being like the most perfect Joel I don't know who we could get as Ellie I've seen people say Ellen Page but like I think she's a little bit old for that now like I mean she still looks young but not that young to play a teenage girl potentially so I don't see that happening but yeah I could definitely see Hugh Jackman as Joel um and so yeah that's pretty much the update we have with the Uncharted movie and the big news that The Last of Us is getting an HBO series. It kind of sounds to me like this HBO series could be coming sooner than people think because it just comes off to me like this is a big deal. This is something that's kind of been in the works for a little bit, but I'm going to be definitely paying attention to it and reporting on who they end up casting as uh, as the roles here and what the story is going to end up being about, and I can't wait to see it. I mean, geez, you know, I guess my only hope is that Neil Druckmann isn't getting overwhelmed himself here with... You know, he has to finish up The Last of Us Part Two. He's presumably working on a new IP uh, for Next Generation with the PS5, and now he's going to be part of writing The Last of Us uh, TV series or HBO series. So it will be interesting uh, to see how this all plays out. But um, if you could do me a favor before we move on to the next topic here, we have about 420 people watching. Be sure to hit that like button if you want to help the stream out and uh, just show your support. It's the easiest way for you to do so. And moving on here, we're going to talk about the PlayStation 2 turning 20 years old on March 4th. Now, this was a, a big deal because, as most of you know, the PlayStation 2 is the best-selling home console of all time, I believe sitting at around 158 million units sold, which is absolutely insane. And so far, no console has ever topped that. It seemed at some point that the PS4 was going to be able to top that. And I know there's some people who think that the PS4 will be able to top that. I don't think it will. 
I, I just think it's going to lose too much steam too quickly, but you never know. And obviously there's going to be people saying that, oh, well, I, maybe the PS5 could be the one that does it. Maybe it could be. But the fact that it's turning 20 years old, I just had to take at least a few minutes here on the podcast to uh, not only acknowledge that, but just talk a little bit about my history with PlayStation that some people may not be aware of. Because even though I took a long break from PlayStation, I did grow up playing PlayStation mainly, and the PS2 was probably the most influential console, which definitely makes you question why I left it. But you know, I think a lot of people went over to the Xbox 360 uh, when the PS3 was announced as well. And, um, you know, I have just so much time spent on the PlayStation 2, uh, so many games, like even just like the Grand Theft Auto games, but I think about the Metal Gear Solid games, and Metal Gear Solid is probably my all-time favorite gaming series, uh, probably right up there with Dark Souls, but Metal Gear Solid story-wise, 100%, like best characters ever, most engaging story for me, and I sit back and I remember... Uh, finishing the <laughs> finishing the ending of Metal Gear Solid 2 and Metal Gear Solid 3, and I literally can't decide like which one was more impactful. I think it's Metal Gear Solid 3, but those were just some amazing experiences, honestly. And I think when people think back to the PlayStation 2, a lot of people's love for the PlayStation brand probably really started there. Um, but I also I, I had a PlayStation 1 as well. It was like one of my first ever gaming consoles. Um, And it was amazing, but there was just something about the PS2, I guess, is like as I I got a little bit older and I became a little bit more mature and I started playing more mature themed games, my love of mature themed games actually stemmed from uh, the PlayStation 2 era, believe it or not. And it's just, I don't know, it's crazy to think that it's 20 years old now and it's just like, I don't under, I, I, I don't. I don't know, man. Like, I don't, I mean, I do understand why it sold as well as it did, right? Like, the fact that it was a DVD player. But I guess I'm just wondering, like, if any other game console will be able to top that. And hopefully it will. Hopefully the PS2 wasn't really just the peak of, you know, what a console can do sales wise. But it'll be interesting to, uh, to see with the PlayStation 5 how well that ends up selling. And more importantly, it's going to be interesting to see where the PS4 ends, and again, this just kind of shows Sony is competing with themselves here, you know, it seems like they're always competing with themselves somehow, and uh, yeah, uh, we'll see if Xbox can really bring the heat console sales-wise next generation, we're going to have to see about that, but we do have some more topics here to go over and discuss, Um, we have new evidence that has emerged, okay, and People got really upset with me for some reason. At least it seemed like it in the comment section. At least some people got really upset with me for talking about this. I don't know why. It's actual literal evidence of something. It's not really... I mean, yeah, it creates a lot of speculation. But the evidence I'm talking about is the fact that Remedy Entertainment and PlayStation are working together on something. So, True Witty here. Appreciate the super chat, buddy. You say, not me. PlayStation was my number one console of choice. Well, you know, I think a lot of people have that mindset, honestly. I think a lot of people have that same opinion. Uh, Unfortunately for me, I don't say unfortunately because it wasn't a bad thing, but I actually ended up kind of converting to Xbox during the, apparently there's a motorcycle gang driving by right now, but uh, um, hopefully it's not the Xbox coming to get me, you know? Um, (laughs) But when I, I kind of like switched over to the Xbox 360 and it just kind of won me over and I stuck with Xbox for quite some time. But then obviously, as you guys saw during towards the end of the, this generation, I, I moved over to uh, PlayStation, which I'm, I came back to it and I'm really glad I did. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of people true witty kind of had that same uh, mentality and mindset that you do where it's just PlayStation has like always been number one for them. And I guess in a way it kind of has been for me as well, even if I didn't realize it. So, uh, but talking about Remedy Entertainment and PlayStation working on something together, what makes this so interesting is this is not just a random rumor. This is not like some guy in a forum saying something, a developer at Remedy on their LinkedIn profile, it actually, on their profile said that they were a co-developer with, um, what is it, XDev or Sony XDev. It's the 
uh, subsidiary to PlayStation, which you know kind of works with uh, second on second party deals. And anytime Sony has a second party deal or relationship with a studio where they're creating an exclusive game, uh, X Dev kind of works with them. And so this is unless it was some kind of big mistake, this is literal proof that something between Remedy and PlayStation is happening. Now, it's more... I've seen, like, people bring up the fact that it, it means that they're going to buy them or they already bought them. I don't think they already bought Remedy because looking into it and doing some more research, it turns out that in, in if Sony bought Remedy, we would know. We would already know it would be something that would come out publicly. They couldn't really hide that or keep that a secret uh, because I believe Remedy is a publicly traded company and so i don't think it's that it could be a sign that they're getting ready to make the official uh or, or make the purchase official if it's something that they're getting ready to do uh, and actually go through with it and make it happen uh, because if they were talking about it we won't necessarily know about them talking about it but if they already did it we would know about it so the other thing is well clearly they're making a playstation game a playstation exclusive and Wi-Fi 5G, Josh, appreciate the super chat, buddy. Uh, you didn't say anything, but you're you're giving me a fist bump here, and uh, yeah, right back at you, buddy. Appreciate your support here on the channel. But talking about this exclusive game, it really makes me wonder because around the same time that we saw Shuhei Yoshida visiting Remedy Games and kind of talking with them, um, it you know we were hearing that Remedy actually bought back the rights to Alan Wake, and that was kind of a big deal. And so a lot of people were hoping that maybe we'll get like an Alan Wake remaster uh, or remake or something along those lines for the PS4 and, and Xbox One, which we might still at some point. But it wouldn't surprise me, and I speculated on this a while ago when we learned about this. It wouldn't surprise me if what Sony and uh, Remedy you're working on together is Alan Wake 2 because it has become very clear that Remedy or Sam Lake specifically wants to continue Alan Wake. He wants to continue that story, but Microsoft wouldn't let him and they, pro and, and they wouldn't fund it. And now they had to buy back the IP or the rights to it. And so maybe Sony was like, look, you guys, we, you know, we, we think what you're doing with Control is great. And Control was a really great game. I mean, Remedy, in my opinion, has always been pretty good, but Control was really good. Um, Control was, in my opinion, way better than Quantum Break. Quantum Break was okay, but Control was phenomenal. I actually platinumed the game. Uh, some of the best gameplay I've, I've experienced uh, in, in 2019, or in, in a while, actually. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Sony kind of went there and was like, look, like, do you want to do something with us? Like, we'll give you funding. We'll provide the funding we want you to make something for us. And they struck a deal. We're like, well, I mean, listen, for all we know, Sony could have helped Remedy potentially. And may maybe this is, maybe I'm, you know, speaking ignorantly here. But I, for all we know, maybe Sony helped Remedy actually buy back the rights to Alan Wake. And they're like, we'll help you do this if you agree to make the game for us and make it exclusive to PlayStation 5. And we'll, we'll help you buy this back and we'll give you some funding for the game. And you guys can do that. I could see that happening. Um, it could be something else. It could be a new IP. It could be the sequel to Control. We have to understand that Control, even though maybe it didn't sell too great, uh, from what I've heard, it was critically acclaimed. And that is important to Sony, obviously. Sony has a, a high bar for quality for most of their AAA games, if not all of them. And so maybe they struck a deal where they're like, look, you know, we think Control is going to be really good. We played it. We like it. Why don't you, let's strike a deal, we'll fund the sequel. Regardless of how the first one sells, uh, we'll fund the sequel because we want to get this on our platform exclusively. I could see a situation like that. It could be a new IP, uh, but I think something is happening. Well, I don't want to say I think, I mean, this is kind of proof based off of this individual's LinkedIn profile that something between Sony and Remedy is happening. It's also worth noting that Control just made its way onto PlayStation Now, and I think it's going to be there for a while. So, possibly another sign that you know uh sony is you know getting getting real close with remedy if they haven't already so that um that to me was something that was certainly worth making a video on and certainly worth mentioning here because it's it's a big it's if remedy is making an exclusive game for playstation and it does like i'll tell you this 
It's one thing if Remedy's making an exclusive game for PlayStation, and it ends up being a PS5 exclusive. It's another thing entirely if that game ends up being Alan Wake 2. You are going to see the hammer come down on Microsoft with the gaming community, and it's going to be, like, that would be such a good look for Sony. And if there's one thing Sony likes is to look good. I mean, any all these companies like to look good, but you're, you want to talk about goodwill? You want to talk about Mindshare? That's how you do it. And Sony, to me, is the kind of company where they're like, you know, uh, how about how about we help you buy back those rights to Alan Wake 2? But, you know, then again, like, Microsoft probably, like, it's funny because they had to agree to give those rights back to Remedy. And it just kind of makes you think to yourself, like, you know, maybe they did it and didn't realize Sony was involved. And now they're like, oh, no, like maybe we made a mistake. This is going to work against us. But I don't know. I think Microsoft would have, it, they would have been smart to greenlight an Alan Wake too. I think it could have been very successful, but that day has uh, come and passed. I see somebody here in chat randomly just caught my eye or saying the PS5 reveal is March 20th. I don't know. I don't know. It's really difficult to talk about the PlayStation 5 when it comes to the reveal at this point because I don't know. Maybe Sony is just like, look. We're not worried about when we're going to reveal the PS5. We're going to we're not going to reveal it until July after all of our games are out on PS4 and we marketed them. I mean, we don't know at this point. We really don't. Um, and the fact that the coronavirus is in seemingly, I don't know if it's in full swing right now. I don't know if it's going to slow down or if it is slowing down, but it's still a thing, a big thing. It's just all the more reason for them to be like, we're going to wait to talk about it. We're just going to market our games right now. I don't want to believe that Sony's going to wait till July to talk about the PS5, but we just don't know. I'm not, I mean, I don't know. You're just randomly saying March 20th. I don't know if there's anything behind that. At this point, I don't think it matters. You know, like it, it, unless like an, a, a literal uh, industry professional who who would have the actual knowledge, or unless somebody from Sony slips up, I wouldn't. But I wouldn't believe anything at this point. You know, uh, we thought it was going to be March third. We thought it was going to be February fifth. We thought it was going to be February 29th, You know, and it just it never happened. So I don't know. It, it, it's it's something that I want to happen, but I don't want Sony to rush it, and I don't think it matters ultimately. Like I've seen people kind of spin the narrative that oh, Sony's just doing damage. The more you know, the longer they remain quiet. No, they're not. Like they're not. Like I'm sorry, they're not. Like the second Sony starts going in the full ps5 marketing you're gonna see how how they did no damage like you're gonna see really really quickly just how they're gonna get the ball rolling and the snowball effect that will be created granted i'm not saying microsoft won't or isn't preparing to do the same thing but believe me when i tell you you're just you're not going to see sony's not doing damage to themselves uh, that's the point they're not um they have possibly the best end to a generation ever or one of the best and they're that's going to lead them into the playstation 5 and we have no idea what's coming with the playstation 5 what we do know for a fact is we're going to get some awesome shit with the ps5 and that and believe me like just like i said earlier the t-flops ain't going to matter they won't matter i don't like saying ain't that just sounds like improper they will not matter uh true witty you say here i think a reveal would be after ghosts of tsushima's release to be honest and yeah i mean it makes a lot of sense we may have gotten our biggest playstation 5 reveal hint in the release date of ghost of tsushima for all we know and i can agree with that i don't think it, i mean how likely is it that's where it's kind of 50 50 up in the air i mean the chances that sony will not talk about the ps5 at all at all between now and july seems unlikely to me but they could still talk about it but not do a full reveal you know uh wi-fi 5g josh uh try saying that five times um once again appreciate the super chat buddy you're saying so sony pulling a cdpr info drop when it's ready yeah, I mean, that's the thing is they have that ability just like CD Projekt Red does, just like Rockstar does where it's like, we will talk when we are ready. We don't need to talk because people are demanding it. We will talk when we're ready. And the thing is, when they do talk, again, it's just like when, when Sony decides to throw that lighter or throw that match down on that puddle of gasoline, that giant puddle of gasoline that's sitting there, They'll do it when they're ready because they know the explosion that's going to ensue when they do it. 
And I think that's what people seem to not understand is that like that is the best metaphor I can give right now for the position that Sony is in when it comes to next generation and the PlayStation 5 is they're just sitting back smoking their cigarette or cigar, whatever, you know, kind of like big boss, I guess, just chilling and like, yeah, everybody can say what they want. Everybody can do what they want. We know what we're doing. And when I'm done smoking this cigar, I'm going to toss it out. It's going to hit that massive puddle of gasoline and it's going to consume everybody, you know? And, uh, and I think Sony is aware of that. I think there are some fanboys who don't want to believe that. And because Sony is being silent, they're using that as an easy way to downplay what is about to happen. Now, are there people on the other side who are completely downplaying what Microsoft is doing? Yeah. I mean, listen, I understand that a lot of you here are not big fans of Xbox, but we can't completely downplay what they've been doing. They've been doing it right. They've been doing some good things. I still think they have a lot to prove, but they seem to be on the right track. But Sony doesn't, in my opinion, Sony doesn't have anything to prove. They've, they literally don't. And I'm not trying to exaggerate when I say that, but I look at, again, just the games we're getting within the next six months. Yeah. Sony, you don't have to prove anything to me. Okay. I don't care what your T-flop count is. Just give me those, just keep those games coming. That's all that matters to me. Um, Ryan uh, Morin, appreciate the super chat, buddy. Uh, you didn't say anything, but I uh, appreciate your support nonetheless. I uh, really do. Uh, and that goes for the 430 people watching right now. For those of you who haven't, I apologize for sounding so redundant, but I wouldn't say it if it didn't really help a tremendous amount. Be sure to hit the like button. I would appreciate it if we could get to 500 likes and then maybe 1,000 likes once the podcast is up and people can watch it um, once it's done being streamed. So hit that like button. Let's see if we can get it up to 500 likes. But yeah, it's just hard not to just kind of sit here and rant a little bit about the potential of the PlayStation 5 and what's going to end up happening because the hype, you know, I think people are not losing hype. I think the problem is it's becoming more difficult to continually talk about the PS5 as much as we want to. And believe me, as a content creator specifically focused on PlayStation, boy, do I want to talk about the PS5 any chance or any opportunity I get. But I think it's becoming harder to do so because it, you know, Sony has been quiet for so long. We've gotten so many leaks and so many rumors that have been proven so wrong you know, and there's so many supposed insiders. It's just, it's hard not to just continue talking about it without it seeming extremely forced. But I think that's where just kind of the conversation surrounding the PS5 has to alter a little bit where, you know, as I said, I'm not going to be covering nearly as many leaks or rumors unless they are truly coming from uh, credible sources. Like for example, I think right now during a podcast, this is a more appropriate time to maybe talk about certain leaks or rumors or supposed insiders that are lurking on forums and whatnot because it, there's just more leeway to kind of talk about different subjects like that. Like one individual that uh, somebody brought to my attention, I believe we mentioned it before, is Klee Game Fan from Reset Era. I mean, this is a person who apparently, based off of what people have told me and based off of what I've looked into, People have said this guy is 100% legit, and he does not lie. And everything he's said, or most of everything he said, has turned out to be true. He's not really that questionable. And he's another person that's saying the PS5 is better performing, more powerful. But, you know, we have other individuals like Tidex on Twitter um, who is also saying that the, the PS5 has a less a lesser T-flop count, but it's also better performing and is actually giving us the GPU, the CPU, and all this stuff. And it's just like, it's hard not to f to, to kind of like cave into those conversations right now because Sony is currently not talking about it. So I hope that people are understanding as to why I've covered so many leaks and so many rumors. And it's also understandable that a lot of people are like, please ease up on it. But I think we'll find a healthy balance uh, going forward. I, I do think we will. Uh, Wi-Fi 5G Josh, once again, appreciate the super chat again here. You say that Sony uh, says nothing slash it drives the conversation uh, with everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I understand what you're trying to say here. It seems to me like Sony can still drive the... Con I, I, if I'm reading what you're saying here correctly, Sony can still drive the conversation even while saying nothing. So just imagine what's going to happen when they say something. So yeah, 
Uh, Jonathan Gomez, appreciate the super chat, buddy. You say, hey, look up uh, Saga Design 3D on Insta, and it shows what Ghost of Tsushima will sort of look like on the PS5 Pro. I uh, appreciate that, Josh. I will, or Jonathan, I will uh, look into that probably when we are done the podcast. I'll have to go back and look at your message here. Um, I have to imagine that uh, Ghost of Tsushima, as well as The Last of Us Part Two, and potentially many other PS4 games when they are played on the PS5 are going to look absolutely stunning. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that specifically these later games like The Last of Us Part Two and Ghost of Tsushima are going to, like, uh, I, I just, see, it's get, it's it gets me excited to think about it because it's not just about looks, but it's just knowing how good these damn games are, but knowing how good they're going to look too. It's just like, all I want to do is sit here and just like get hyped, but I gotta, I gotta calm myself down. Cause it's like, well, there's still a lot of PS4 games to be played and there's still a lot left before we get to that point. But I mean, yeah, looking at games like ghost of Tsushima and this latest trailer in 4k, I have to sit back and think to myself, my God, God, what what are games gonna look like on the PS5 from Sony's first party? And we just talked yesterday. I made a I made a video on God of War yesterday. For those of you who maybe haven't seen it, I encourage you to go check it out. There's some good info in there. But one of the things we talked about was a, a job listing or a few job listings from Sony Santa Monica. And one of their job listings said that they plan to literally and you know obviously they're not gonna say anything bad about it, but they want to set the bar visually. And they didn't directly reference the PlayStation 5, but obviously we know they're talking about the PlayStation 5. And if there's any studio that, in my opinion, can 100% set the bar, visually speaking, it's Sony Santa Monica. Because seeing how amazing God of War looked, like, I'm not going to lie to you guys, like, I was literally in shock when I actually, you know, because you can watch videos, you know what I mean? And you can go on YouTube and you can watch 4K videos, but it's still compressed, right? When you sit there... And you put God of War, when I put God of War into my PS4 Pro, and the second I saw it, I'm like, holy shit. Like, this is no, this is, I can't believe. I can't believe people are still sitting here busting on the PlayStation 4 Pro for being less powerful when I'm seeing a game like this in front of my eyes right now. Like, I don't understand, like, people who who do that. I mean, I can only assume it's because they just don't like PlayStation, but I don't think anybody can argue that uh, Sony Studios know what they're doing. But we do have one last topic here that we're going to discuss before I just fully move on to engaging with the chat. And that has to do with dreams. And we haven't talked about dreams in a little while. I'm still contemplating whether or not I want to do a stream of it. I've been kind of waiting to just let more and more people create more and more content. So that way when I do go to play it, it you know there's a lot to choose from. Uh, we probably will do a stream of that at some point though. But uh, True Witty, once again, appreciate the super chat, buddy. You're saying Ghost of Tsushima and The Last of Us 2 shows T-Flops doesn't matter. And yeah, I agree. As you can tell by my title, I 100% agree. I don't know how long it's going to take, if, if it's ever going to get beat into some people's heads, that it, it the T-Flop matter, it matter, the T-Flop count isn't going to matter at the end of the day nearly as much as it seems like it will right now. It's easy to have these conversations right now because we're not seeing anything, right? Uh, the closest thing we've seen from next gen is Hellblade 2. And as you can see, it's going to look amazing. But you think Sony's games aren't going to look as good or even better? Believe me, they will, regardless of T-Flop count. So appreciate that, True Witty. We have Ryan uh, Morin once again. Appreciate your super chat as well. Ideal The Last of Us cast for you. Uh, will HBO pull, pull it off? Uh, well, the, as I said uh, earlier, the ideal cast, I, I can really only think about Joel and Hugh Jackman as Joel. I honestly can't think of anybody off the top of my head, and I haven't really looked into it for Ellie. Um, and I do think they will pull it off. I really do, and I think it's going to shock people. Maybe that's me being overly optimistic. We do have to be cautious because it could go horribly wrong. It could. But the fact that Neil Druckmann is involved and it's HBO, we know that they don't just greenlight anything, it gives me a lot of hope that they will, in fact, be able to pull it off. And I think it's going to be a great time, uh, honestly, when it comes out. And I'm really excited. So hopefully that answers your question. But moving back to the final topic here, talking about dreams, it turns out, and this was the big question about dreams, right? The big question about dreams as well Sony allowed uh, Media Molecule to like work on this game for like years and years and years. Was it worth it? Is it going to be a, a success? 
Critically, obviously, as we talked about, it was a success. It's one of the highest rated games on PlayStation, right? Uh, one of the highest rated PlayStation exclusives. It's obviously a critical success. But it seems as though there is uh, some confirmation here that it has actually sold well, maybe better than Sony. We, I mean, we don't know what Sony's expectations were. I have to imagine they weren't that high. No offense to the game, but it's just the nature of that type of game and how long it's been in development, the way it's been marketed. Apparently, it was the fifth most downloaded game in February on uh, PlayStation, which is incredible, honestly, considering the division was at number one because it was on sale for $3. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we have Xavier DJ. Welcome to the channel, buddy. You are a new member, and I want to take a second here to uh, thoroughly and sincerely thank you for your decision to support me directly. It is greatly appreciated, and it goes a long way. So welcome. Uh, you are now a member, and if you stick around long enough, you can increase, not increase, but you'll see your logo will change color to where anybody who is a member of the channel for one year, you will actually get the classic PlayStation logo next to your name, and it will be a sign that you have been a supporter for quite some time, but all the support is appreciated, and so thank you for becoming a new member, buddy. Um... But yeah, getting back to Dreams here, it seems that Dreams is actually somewhat of a sales success. Now, I don't think the NPD has come out yet. It'll be interesting to see if it made it to the NPD, because I think, if I'm not mistaken, the NPD only counts um, physical sales. So we'll see if it sold well physically or not. But hopefully this is a good sign for the game, because we want to see that game continue. I've talked about it in previous uh, podcasts as well as previous videos, but it's a very unique game, and I think that a lot of people are really happy with it and and, and surprised by it, and hopefully it's something that Sony will continue to support for many years to come. But I just had to make sure I brought that up in here where, yeah, you know, maybe I'll do a dedicated video on Dreams later on too as well because I know not everybody watches the podcast and is able to make it this far in, but... Maybe we'll talk more about this game in the future, or like I said, we'll do a live stream. Um, something else I do want to briefly uh, mention here. Uh, well, first I want to see, Xavier DJ says that uh, I think Hugh Jackman would be wonderful for the role. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I noticed that a lot of people agreed with me when I said that. Like when I mentioned Hugh Jackman, there's a lot of people who also agree. They think that he would be perfect for the role of Joel. So, um but one last thing I do want to mention here before just fully interacting with the chat is I want to talk about Neo 2 briefly because I'm kind of in a predicament here where a part of me really wants to get this game and play it. Another part of me is absolutely terrified because I did play it a little bit. Uh, granted, I, I really didn't have much time to play it and I got, I got crushed um, and I, I felt overwhelmed because there's just so much to learn in the game. Um, and so I was just, I kind of like backed away from it. I'm like, Hmm. So I, I go on YouTube and I'm, I start watching more and more gameplay and my God, this game looks frighteningly difficult. Like it's frightening to me. And I, I just think to myself, like I beat dark souls one through three, I beat bloodborne. And so a part of me feels like, Oh, I shouldn't worry. Like I should have no problem with this game. But I, I was watching like the boss battle and I'm like, this looks insane. Like, this looks absolutely insane, and so I'm genuinely, like, torn between whether or not I want to play this game. I've seen some people say that they would like me to stream it, because it would be extremely entertaining, I assume, for people to watch me more than likely get my ass handed to me over and over and over again, and potentially rage. And so, maybe that's something that I could do, but I don't want that to be the only reason I buy the game and play it, obviously. Like, I want to... I'm just so torn, and so, I don't know, I guess... I'm not expecting an answer from anybody because I'm going to have to decide for myself, but I just thought it was worth saying that because I'm just genuinely concerned that like I'm going to put my fist through the wall multiple times playing that game and I'm not trying to play something that's going to do that to me or break multiple controllers, you know, like I'm not trying to do that. Uh, but Mr. Hamster, once again, uh, appreciate your, your continued super chats here. You say, make MBG get crushed raging on Neo 2. Uh, video um you know it would be really fun to, w what would be really funny is if i did decide to um stream it and uh, there was a lot of rage inducing moments it would be funny to get like a compilation of that going but i don't know man like that it, it, it sounds kind of torturous in a way you know like the idea of just subjecting myself to that uh do it for one million likes 
I don't think that would happen. I mean, if I were to ever get like, I mean, you know, I'm in a position where getting over a thousand likes is uh, is awesome for me. Uh, One million likes, I wouldn't know what to do with that. I would have to do something a little bit more than just stream Neo if that were to happen. But um, we'll see. I, I see a lot of you guys saying do it, get it. And I don't know, maybe that's why I mentioned it here, because I need that extra encouragement where I'm like, I don't know, man, like, it's very rare I see a video game that genuinely scares me. That's not a horror game that scare. It, it makes me fearful of what, what it will do to my mind, you know? <laughs> so I don't know. I'm not going to definitively say right now that, yes, I'm going to get it, but we'll see. We'll see. I will say that if I do get it, I will stream it at some point. However... I don't know if I'm going to stream it as soon as I, like, my first time playing it. Not, not because I feel like I need to get good, but because I noticed there's so much to learn in that game. That, like, half the game is, like, learning everything about it. It's just, like, kind of overwhelming. But I don't know. Maybe, like, we could do something where the chat helps me and it helps me figure things out. I don't know. We could play it together. We'll see about that. And Mr. Hamster, once again, you say, I have a playlist of all MVG Best Rage videos. Do you really? That That's interesting. Um, Wi-Fi 5G Josh, you say that uh, they have a desktop uh, punching bag, so when you rage, that's a genius idea actually. Um, did anybody, you know, it kind of this conversation reminds me of uh, that guy Ninja. There was like a bunch of controversy around a comment he made about uh, getting angry with video games and like losing. And how, like, you're basically a failure if you, like, you've lost twice if you don't get angry. And, like, there was just a lot of uh, controversy around that. And I just, I couldn't help but laugh at it because I'm just kind of like, I don't, I don't have a problem with, nin- like, I don't follow Ninja or anything. Like, you know, he's made a good career for himself, obviously. But I'm just like, I, is it is it that serious for everybody, though? I mean, like, I understand for you and people in your position, it's like, yeah, you're making a living, and like, you know, top tier sports guys, right, even top tier sports guys that will tell you it's just a game, but I mean, I get it, like, I get it, but it's like, is it that serious where you have to make like a declaration like you lost twice, like, it it literally reminds me of that, uh, oh, what was that movie, Talladega Nights, where it's like, Ricky Bobby, like, if you're not first, you're last, you know, it's like, that's not a healthy mindset, man. Like, you know, I mean, I get it's, it's the idea of like, always be competitive, always strive to be better. But I guess my argument to that would be, you don't always need to get angry to become better. You know what I'm saying? Like anger will only serve you so long until it works against you. And I guess that's my argument with that. But I just thought that that was interesting. I know that we're, I'm mentioning this like super late, but talking about Neo 2, um, kind of just reminded me of that a little bit, but yeah. Um, so now at this point, uh, I'm going to move over to interacting with the chat for a little bit, uh, so we can have just a little bit more conversation here before we come to the end of the podcast. And so looking over here, uh, James C says, when do you expect PlayStation five pre-orders to go live? Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, there's that like supposed insider account on Twitter, PlayStation Erbis or Erbis, whatever. Uh, I've covered them like I think once or twice on the channel. They've been radio silent as well. We also don't know if they're actually an insider. They claim that pre-orders are going to go live this month, which would obviously mean that Sony will be talking about the PlayStation 5 this month, so we will see. I will say that that account, PlayStation Earbus, they've been pretty pretty confident. I'll just put it that way. They have come off very confident in the things that they have said. They have also deleted tweets in the past, Uh, so we're going to find out really soon how credible some of these people are, and uh, I, I can't lie i mean i won't lie i haven't been keeping all the receipts but there are certainly some individuals that have went out you know put their neck out here a little bit more than others so we're gonna see we're gonna see um mr hamster says the best mbg rage video is when mbg said i'm not going to send microsoft the wrong message i miss those good old days 
Yeah, I mean, it's been harder to go on rant vid- videos because not only I try not to be negative, right? Like, I feel like ranting and raging, yeah, it's funny and it's entertaining, but I try not to be overly negative. However, I am certainly not the person that's going to force positivity where it's not needed or even in moments where it's certainly not how people should be reacting. Um, but Microsoft hasn't given me much of a reason, uh, to be completely honest here, to rage at them. Um, the last time I raged at them, and uh, I think was like with uh, XO19, uh, because I was just like, what? what is this, man? Like, it's so cringy. It's terrible. Like, but then uh, almost immediately after that, they revealed the Xbox Series X and Hellblade 2. And I was like, oh, okay, I can't rage at that. But um, but yeah, we'll see when PlayStation 5 pre-orders go live. We're going to see if that PlayStation Earbus account ends up being legitimate or, or not. Um, and, you know, I got to tell you guys, like, and I'm going to be honest here, I've reached out to some of these individuals who are so-called insiders or supposedly have you know the inside track they have this information that they just know but they're not going to reveal it and nobody's told me anything i'm not gonna lie to you like no like nobody even when i said look like i'm not gonna come out here and reveal who i'm getting this information from which would then turn me into one of those people but i just mainly for myself i just wanted to see like and I'm not saying that that means for sure that they're liars or that they're making it up. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to point the finger at anybody. I mean, there certainly are those who do. But I have to say, like, it's just disappointing where it's like, well, I have a platform here where I could help validate that a little bit. And they're not willing to allow that to happen. And that just kind of tells me, well, eh, okay. I mean, it's it's hard to take somebody's word for it. And that's where you do have to look at their track record. But like I said, guys, we are going to see. We are going to see very soon. This is why I've never, ever claimed to have inside sources. Because I don't. I don't have anybody on the inside. And here's the thing. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Even if I did, I don't see myself ever making that publicly known. I would literally probably just keep it to myself. And at the very least, just kind of subtly make very subtle hints at the, the fact that I might know something. In fact, for all you know, maybe that's what I'm doing now. I'm not. Rest assured, I am not. I don't have any inside track on anything. I don't know Sony's plans. I don't know anybody who knows Sony's plans. I don't know anything. But uh, I've never wanted to be that way because I just feel like that's not fair. You know what I mean? Like, there's just so many people who are just like, they, they just, they make such bold claims. And then they just say, trust me. You know? Um, and I just feel like that's a little bit, I don't know. Liar, liar. Pants on fire. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I guess some people are going to feel the heat. (laughs) Some people are going to feel the heat. However, here's the thing. I don't want that to happen because a lot of what these people have been saying is stuff that I want from the PlayStation 5. It's stuff that gets me excited. So the truth is, I hope they all, most of them end up being correct because it all sounds awesome. But I don't know. Is this live or is it pre-recorded? No, this is live. We are live right now. Um, once this is over, people can watch it after the fact. Uh, but let's go back to the chat here. Um, Jared says, I do hope there is a pro. i assuming you're saying like a pro model of the PS5. Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I think that your hope uh, will come true. I think there will be a pro. However... I don't think it's likely it's going to launch at the same time as the base model PS5. I think you're going to see another mid-gen refresh potentially from Sony because it worked really well for them with the PS4 Pro. There's pretty much no reason for them not to do it again. So, yeah. Um, Let me take another drink of water here while I'm looking at the chat. Look, Sony isn't shutting down teraflops with Ghost of Tsushima. The game looks amazing, but come on, people want to know about the PS5. PS4 games don't have anything to do with next generation. Um, I'm not. I'm just gonna flat out say I think you're wrong there. Honestly, um, looking at current gen games actually, in my opinion, gives you a very good inclination of what you're gonna see next generation, because if you can look at what Sony can do with a lower teraflop count. 
the 4.2 teflops of the PS4 Pro compared to the 6 teflops of the Xbox One X, and they can make a game look as good as it looks with Ghost of Tsushima and other games like The Last of Us Part Two. it does give you a really good inclination of what you're going to see from Sony Studios with even more powerful hardware, regardless of the teflop number. I mean, the truth is, the PlayStation 5, is go- its APU is going to be next generation. It's going to be on next generation architecture. So, yeah, it does give you a good uh, look, in my opinion. And, uh, yes, good morning to you as well, Devil Child. Appreciate you could finally make it to the stream after an hour and 43 minutes. But, hey, I'm glad you're here. Really am. Um, let's see. Uh, Xbox... Somebody says, what the hell is a teraflop? A teraflop is the overall, it's like, um, it's just like the overall measurement of total compute power that like a, a console will have. Like, I, I mean, I, I'm sure I could, you know, Google like an actual, uh, you know, a, a better definition because what I just said probably doesn't sound that great. But let's see, what is a teraflop? Maybe I can give a better answer here. Specifically, a teraflop refers to the capability of a processor to calculate one trillion floating point operations per second. Microsoft rates, and I don't and this is just literally the first thing that comes up on Google. I guess maybe the T-flop war isn't over yet. Microsoft rates its Xbox Series X custom processor at 12 T-flops, meaning that the console is capable of performing 12 tri- trillion floating point calculations each second. That is the l- actual definition of of what a teraflop is. So at this point, it's up to you to determine how relevant that is going to be to you when you sit down and play a game. Let's grab MBG and uh, jamming some Skylanders, bro. No, no, we are never talking about Skylanders again. Let's get that straight. All right, we're not talking about Skylanders again. Um, let's see here. Um... If specs don't matter, save up your money and stay with your PS4's exclusives will be available on both consoles, right? Well, no, actually, uh, Don, we don't know that. Uh, Sony has not made it crystal clear, like Microsoft, that they're going to have all of their games be cross-generation. In fact, I'd say it's much more likely that Sony will not follow Microsoft's footsteps and make all of their games cross-generation, so no. Uh, But also... um, Keep in mind, nobody's saying power doesn't matter. We're saying T-flops don't matter. Power matters. And the most important thing that we need to know is that the next generation console will be a next generation architecture and it will be not too far off, whether it be a little bit more powerful or a little bit less powerful from what the Xbox Series X will be. And I say the Xbox Series X because we know what that will be. So Power does matter. It just doesn't necessarily matter which console is going to be the more powerful one. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, what am I playing? Um, well, the gameplay you're seeing in the background right now is the Division 2. That's what I've been playing, the new expansion that has come out. Um, I'm probably going to... I, again, I'm... Contemplating whether or not I want to play Dreams, so or not Dreams, uh, Neo 2. Two very different games there. <laughs> um, and so that might be the next game I play. We'll have to see, though. Um, I just don't want to buy Neo 2 and then, like, try to get into it and, be, like, after a couple hours be like, I can't do this, like, I'm not having fun, I, and, and realize I just wasted money on that game, you know? Like, I don't want that to happen. Um, gamer... Uh, Fanatics says power matters when there's games to show it. Exactly. I mean, like, it's up to the games to, you know, really show what a console is capable of. And you better believe that Sony is going to make sure that for both first, especially their first party, but even third party games. And that's the thing, too, is like people don't understand that the, the chances of Sony being the market leader once again, console wise, with the PlayStation 5 is so. Uh, like high, right? That developers pay attention to the console market leader and they're not going to ignore the PS5 just because it may not be exactly 12 T-flops. Like they're going to make their games look perfectly good on the, on the PlayStation 5. And trust me, like it'll be interesting. Like I don't want to sit here and say that there won't be any difference because obviously we know that 
Digital Foundry is going to point out the differences, if there's any. Whether the PlayStation 5 is more powerful or less powerful than the Xbox Series X. It's just going to be up to people to determine how big is that difference. You know? Like, and there are games, like, here, okay, I'll be fair right now. One of the games I played a lot on both the PlayStation 4 Pro and the Xbox One X is PUBG. Um, and I can admit that the game looks significantly better in some ways on the Xbox One X uh, than it does on the PS4 Pro. But at the same time, there's many other games I played, like The Division 2 is, is one where, well, actually, I don't know if I played that on the Xbox One X. I'm, I'm trying to think of games that I played on both, but I know there are those games where I played it on both, and I'm just like, there's not that big of a difference. And I guess, like, for some people, if, like, you know, GTA 6, for example, if there's going to be some kind of big difference between that game, which I don't think there will be, again, I'm making a ton of assumptions here, if GTA 6 in 2023 comes out and it looks, like, you know, significantly better on the Series X than the PS5, then okay. Then I can understand why people would be like, I don't want to play this on the PS5. You know, but if power was everything, if power was everything, then you do actually have to ask the question... Why aren't you gaming on PC? I'm just saying, if it's that important, you know what I mean? And that's where, like, I think Sony understands that to the console gaming market, it's not everything. It's not that important. It's important. It's just not everything. It's hard not to talk about the power factor right now, because that's, like, it's really the only thing that's going on between these consoles um, currently, until we learn about more games and more features and stuff like that. Uh, my, my, my voice is definitely going hoarse here because I, I think I like, I think I don't realize it, but I think I like scream. <laughs> like I pretty much yell the entire time I'm talking during this podcast on a weekly basis. But um, Devil Child, you say you hope that there will be a new Gran Turismo launch title. Yeah, I've seen people kind of go back and forth um, with that. We'll see whether it's going to be there at launch. Uh, I see Seth, you say PUBG isn't all that graphically impressive to begin with. Yeah. That's true. It's just a higher resolution, ultimately, on the Xbox One X. But it doesn't look like a completely different game or anything. Uh, Duncan says, there's a good chance the PS5 will be more capable than the Xbox. Hmm. I hope so. I hope so. I only say that because, man, I'm not, like, here, I'm going to be real. Like, as a PlayStation enthusiast now, as somebody who has a PlayStation channel, yeah, I hope that the PS5 has the edge. Not so I can, like make fun of xbox or its fans but just because it's like hey it's always good to just have that little because here's the reality like if the xbox is more powerful even if it was like okay if there was a situation where the ps5 was 11.9 t-flops and the xbox series x was literally 12.0 t-flops xbox fans are gonna have that they're they're gonna run with that you know and they're gonna have that to like push against playstation fans and be like ha we got the more powerful console, even though it means literally nothing. But there's always that, like, you know, I guess that's where you could call, like, oh, it's the console wars. But listen, there's those who, who participate in the console wars and realize it's just for a little bit of fun, just conversation. You know, it's not meant to actually be taken very seriously at all. It's not meant to get people upset or worked up. It's just for fun. It's just like playing a game. You know what I mean? It's just like making jokes. Versus the other set of people who literally think this is like life or death. And it's like, okay, guys, calm down. It's like those people fighting at for, you know fighting over toilet paper at Walmart. Don't do that. Just don't. Don't, fight, don't get into an actual fight over consoles. Don't fight over toilet paper, okay? It's, I feel like the, it's, you're talking about like the same type of people, you know what I mean? When you, when you talk about that. But, uh... Let's see here what else you guys are saying. Uh, James Bond says, one, price, two, exclusives, three, how rich are you to buy both for differences? Okay. Okay, that's fair. Uh, all PS5 developers left for Stadia and Microsoft. And no, see, it's normal. That stuff happens all the time. Yeah, a lot of Sony developers went to Microsoft and went to other places, but they're making way for new talent, for new blood. It's very normal, especially at the transition of a console generation. There's people leaving Microsoft too, you know? Uh, some of the people who worked at the initiative, as far as I know, or at least a few people anyway, already left. As far as I know, I could be wrong on that, but... And, it, and that just goes to show, like, it, like, it's normal for stuff like this to happen. I've seen people panicking because they're like, oh my god, the head of Sony Santa Monica left. Like, is it disappointing she left? A little bit. 
Is it disappointing she left for Google Stadia? Yeah, it is. It really is. Like, it's nothing against her, but my God, why, why go? Like, I would have been more happy to see her go to Microsoft and create something with Xbox Studios than Google, but it's normal. It happens all the time. You know, it, I mean, Rod Ferguson left the coalition. Does that mean the coalition's on fire? No, I don't think so. Anyway, this guy says damage control. I, no, it's not damage control. I mean, it's just, that's just the, literally the way it is. Mike Yabara and Rod Ferguson both left Xbox in the transitional year to their next generation. Does that mean Xbox is on fire and it's over? No, it doesn't. And the same thing's happening with Sony. It happens all the time in this industry. Um, so I see uh, Vegan VR King. You're saying, can we get to 300 likes? Well, I'm seeing we're over 400 likes. So my question is, can we get to 500 likes before the stream ends? Probably not. But hey, the closer we get, the better. That's my goal for today. It's okay if we don't hit it. But, you know, every like is appreciated. Um... Mr. Hamster, you're asking MBG, can you give me some toilet paper? You're going to have to fight me for it, bro. <laughs> you're going to have to fight me for it if you want it. Um, <clears throat> we'll do a few more here. Just, we'll, we'll go a little bit longer. Um, not everyone cares about stupid Stadia. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know what they're going to be able to do for Google Stadia. I, I really don't. I just feel like they're in trouble there. Um, spilled Coffee asks, have I tried PlayStation Now? Do I think it's worth it? I haven't yet. No. I feel like PlayStation Now is something I'm not going to try until I'm, I'm like absolutely forced to do so. But if I ever do, I'll be sure to give you guys an idea of what I think of it and let you know my thoughts on it for sure. I won't play it and then not talk about it. But I'll probably play it sometime next generation. Um, let's see. Xbox equals same power like the PlayStation 5. That would be okay. Okay, yeah. Um, Halo Infinite game of the year with more flops on the Series X. Well, uh, I I mean, I don't know if I agree that Halo Infinite is going to be game of the year. I mean, obviously, we don't know. I think it'll be a great game, potentially. But I'm sorry, man. Like, maybe this is the fanboy coming out of me. Halo Infinite's not going to be able to compete with The Last of Us Part 2. It's just not. I'm sorry. Like, it, it'll be a great game. Not going to compete with The Last of Us Part 2. Um, I, I would argue that Ghost of Tsushima probably has a better chance of being nominated. Uh, Resident Evil 3 Remake as well. That's a game I'm extremely excited for. Cyberpunk. I mean, in my opinion, there's just these games that are just bigger than Halo Infinite. I mean, maybe when we see Halo Infinite gameplay, my tune will change completely, but I don't know, man. Oh, Mr. Hamster saying you're going to knock MBG out with one punch. Okay. All right. We'll see. I don't know, man. I don't like, I don't, I don't feel the need to fight people, you know, unless it's absolutely necessary for self-defense. I guess I'm more of a pacifist that way. Um... Halo stopped being Halo when Bungie left. I think there's still a lot of people who feel that way, uh, which is unfortunate. But um, could you imagine if uh, Destiny ended up being uh, an Xbox exclusive game or Microsoft first party game? <laughs> and apparently that's what Bungie wanted to do. And Microsoft was like, nah, <laughs> I don't know. It's funny the way things work out sometimes in the gaming industry. I see a lot of people agreeing with me or that The Last of Us Part 2 is going to be game of the year. Michael says you really hope that Demon Souls remake is uh, for PS5. Yeah, I hope so too. I hope there's hype around that. Like, I really, I hope there's a lot of hype around um, Demon Souls uh, as a PlayStation 5 exclusive, or just Demon Souls remake in general, because that's a game I'm going to be incredibly excited for. I'm a little bit nervous about how difficult that game's going to be though, because I've heard it's significantly more difficult than Dark Souls, but we'll see. Um, MBG, what about a new Crash game at launch? We could see that as well. That's been rumored for some time. Maybe Sony struck a deal with Activision. Um, Seth, you're saying you can't wait for Doom next Friday. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to play Doom or not. I've heard really good things about it. I didn't play the 2016 Doom game. I'm kind of up in the air with that as well. Like It feels like it's between Doom and Neo 2, and I can't decide. And Neo 2 kind of scares me a little bit. Um, 
see what else you guys are saying here before we end this. Uh, it seems like a lot of you guys are going back and forth at each other in the in the uh, in the chat. Do I play on PC? I do not play on PC. I am a console gamer through and through. I'm just not a fan of playing on PC. Uh, not everybody has strong enough internet for constant streaming. Yep, that is very true. Hellblade 2 engine, you're giving it the thumbs up. Yeah, Hellblade 2 looked really good. I'm excited for that game. Uh, do you think Halo flops? If Halo flops, will Microsoft do a complete restructure? Yeah. If Halo Infinite flops, I mean, like, really flops, oh, yeah, that's trouble. That's trouble for 343. That's trouble for, for Xbox. I don't think it's going to completely flop, though. You have to imagine it can at this point. I mean, they've been working on it for so long. It's a new engine. There's, I mean, I think that they'll do something good, but I'm not a Halo fan, so I feel like I can't speak to Halo too much, honestly. But it'll be interesting to see what Halo fans have to say once they finally get to play Halo Infinite or when they finally see gameplay of Halo Infinite. Apparently, Blue Point's remake is the first three Tenchu games, and they're going to be revealed tomorrow. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I can tell you, no. That's not true. Um, Halo will not flop. It's packing flops. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Am I getting a PS5 day one? Yeah, and I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm a little bit frightened that people are saying it's going to be really, really, really hard to get your hands on a PS5 day one because they're going to be scarce. I really hope not. I hope not. Because I don't want to be in a situation where I have a PlayStation channel here and I don't have a PS5 at launch or around launch. That terrifies me. Uh, not only from just the gamer aspect, but, you know, the part of me that's running this channel. Uh, didn't they say that Halo Infinite is going to have microtransactions? I guess that's what you're trying to say, Mr. Hamster. I don't know. I, it definitely will have microtransactions. Yeah, there was something I covered a long time ago, actually, where... There was like a job listing where they want to somebody who's literally just going to work on microtransactions. Uh, that's kind of common these days for any game that has multiplayer. Um, Enrico, you say I played and finished Demon Souls. I'm sure you can do it as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I can too. I mean, I beat Dark Souls one through three and Bloodborne. Uh, Sekiro is really the only one I haven't played. Um. Sony probably learned their lesson from the PS4 launch date. Uh, you're going to be refreshing the pre-order page? Yeah. I wouldn't do that. I mean, no, I would. I, I'm, I'm going to be doing that. I'm telling you not to do that, so that way there's one less person I have to worry about. <laughs> Am I going to get the Xbox Series X as well? Genuine curiosity, not trolling. Uh, I'm more up in the air with that, honestly, because I'm definitely not going to get both at one time. I'll tell you that. Um, and I know that, like, there's people like, well, if you're a true gamer, like, listen, how about, like, unless you're going to buy it for me, don't, don't tell me, all right? Like, I'm going to buy what I want to buy. I'm going to spend my money on what I want to spend my money on. I have an Xbox One X, and I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Microsoft announcing that all of their games, all of them are going to be cross-gen, it's, they made it really difficult for me to be like, well, if I already plan on getting the PS5, I really don't see why I would need to get an Xbox Series X, considering I'm already an Xbox One X owner, and I can at least rest assured for at least the next two years, I can play all of their games, any games I may be interested in. I mean, if we get like a State of Decay 3 that's like AAA or something, then maybe I will, but we'll see. We'll see. Um... Let's see here before we end this. Because, all right, I think we're going to, um, we're hitting the two-hour mark here. So I think we're going to end the stream here. I don't want it to be, like, ridiculously long. I almost went for three hours last week. But, I, you know, we went over all the topics, engaged with the chat a little bit. And uh, I think this was, an overall, a pretty successful podcast. And I guess I'll just ask one last time before we end it. Hit the like button. Um, we're at 445 likes. Doesn't look like we're going to be able to get to 500, but again, the closer we get, the better. Really helps out the streams, especially after the fact as well. Uh, and I appreciate everybody who showed up, everybody who uh, hung around and hung out with me today, and especially those of you who become members and donated Super Chats. Really goes a long way here on the channel, and your support certainly does not go unnoticed. And, you know, um, it seems like things this past week were relatively quiet, in general, I mean, we got the big news of, uh, you know, RDNA 2 from AMD. We got 
Ghost of Tsushima, and we got The Last of Us series. But, I mean, in terms of, like, next gen and the things that people are really waiting for right now in terms of, like, news and credible leaks or anything or something official from Sony, it's been relatively quiet. So I'm hoping that this week starting, you know, tomorrow, I mean, I know the week starts today, but, you know, going into Monday, uh, the work week, that is, hopefully we'll get some big news from Sony this week. Uh, I'm not expecting anything really, but it would just be great if we could. So just keep it, you know, locked here on the channel. Uh, I know most of you already do that, but if anything big comes up, I will be sure to, uh, you know, um, keep you guys up to date with everything. And so, yeah, as Devil Child says here, slap that like button. And uh, I see some people saying that they believe that Ghost of Tsushima might get delayed. I don't think so. I don't think Ghost of Tsushima is going to get delayed. I won't worry about that. But all right, guys, uh, that is going to do it for Press X Podcast Episode 7. I will hopefully, if all things go well, see you guys back here um, tomorrow. or Not tomorrow. Well, yeah, tomorrow as well if I make a video. But next week for the next uh, Episode 8 a press x podcast it will hopefully be at the same time 12 p.m eastern on sunday i'm going to try my best to keep that as the regular podcast schedule so all right with that being said i will catch you guys later take care